Welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable, doing our Vanderbilt football preview tonight. That's going to be episode 87, if you're wanting to keep track of all the number of episodes we've done. So just knock it on 100 here pretty soon, guys. It's hard to believe we've done that many episodes. Been doing this. This is our third year we've done preview, so we're just after two years of complete full set of uh, podcasts for those that have been from the beginning, we appreciate that. Uh, we are a podcast that talks about sports, if you haven't figured that out already. We do football, we do a little basketball, we do very little baseball, but that's the three sports we concentrate on, and almost entirely it's devoted to the SEC. Sometimes we'll just have to get down a rat hole and we go there. But uh, we do concentrate mostly in the SEC. That's why we are called SEC SRT. We uh, do this weekly. Uh, the format here the last couple weeks have been uh, two separate podcasts each week. So you've been getting a little bit of extra. Uh, but we thought it would be easier to break out each team as we do our preview and do those separately. So you're getting a separate podcast for each team. And last night I was uh, happy enough to get Cole Hodges, a big old Miss fan. And I know, Blair, you just... <coughs> Besides yourself, you weren't able to make that. Um, we did our Ole Miss preview, so you can catch that one uh, on the uh, iTunes. On Stitcher Radio, anywhere you can get an RSS feed, we have a YouTube channel. We are on Facebook uh, and Twitter. SEC SRT is the way to catch us. So love to hear your comments. Uh, get back to us. Let us know how we're doing, what you think. We'd love to know that. Uh, but uh, get into some introductions here. Uh, we've got the, the regular cast and crew here, it looks like, tonight. Blair Smiley from left to right on the TV screen. Yes, go to hell, Ole Miss. Yep, there it is. Cole. Sorry. That's okay. We're, we're not even two minutes in, and we've already got it. So it's, it's going to be a good podcast. Uh, in, in the middle, Drew Young. Drew's, Drew's excited to talk about Vanderbilt, I could tell, already from our pre, pre-show. Yeah, is, is Vandy still in the SEC? Is my question, I guess. <laughs> and go go to hell, go to hell, Cole, for me too. I don't know you, but whatever. <laughs> All right, and I am Shane Bailey, your host of this motley crew. So, what well, our normal way we do this is we go through the football season, we talk about any news that's out there, and then we talk about the week that was and the week that's uh, coming up. Uh, we kind of look at the lines and kind of determine uh, what we think each team is going to do. And uh, there's a little bit of news out there this week, and we, we hit on that some yesterday. That news was just breaking as we recorded. Uh, but uh, it, we've had time to hear some different angles of this, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into that as well uh, before we get into our preview. And you guys weren't able to, to be on last night, so I'd like to get uh, what you guys think about what's going on with Johnny Football. It does, you know, I said last night, it really seems like every week he's going to do something that we get to talk about, and and uh, he, he delivered in, in big fashion to this weekend, it seems. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll go first, Shane. I mean, it, the, the surprising thing is, um, you know, I listened to Darren Ravel today on a couple of radio shows, and, um, you know, to, you know, a lot of the stuff that he's done, and we've talked about this, has just been kind of, boneheaded stuff, but, um, you know, if this is indeed true, um, you know, whether you believe players should, you know, be paid or whatever, that's a whole separate topic, but um, to, to do something like this is, um, it, you know, will be something that's pretty interesting to see how, if they can actually you know, find the proof that, that's behind it, but, um, you know, obviously getting paid for your autograph and the amount of, uh, what is that, the amount of authenticated stuff that has hit eBay to force, uh, you know, Darren Ravel and those guys to start questioning it in February because it got, you know, just flooded the market. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing that was, that I got away from this, and I don't know if y'all heard this today, um, that I took away from it was that was pretty interesting was one of the reasons that this be kind of came to the forefront here in the last couple of months is because that industry which is kind of has the little bit of that uh, back alley black market type of um, you know I, let me have a conversation with a guy that's dealing with memorabilia and I want to take a shower afterwards um, it's one of those deals where Johnny Football, there was so much of his of his 
memorabilia out there, it was dominating everything. And why they're kind of a little bit frustrating was because of all of his antics. The general public has kind of decreased the value of what his memorabilia is worth. And, and so now you have all these guys that supposedly have these signings, you know, with hundreds of items, and now they're kind of sitting on them, losing money. And so it's, it's kind of one of those things that's kind of turned against him a little bit. But uh, I don't know. It's pretty interesting. I, I mean, I'm willing to put money on it that he's not missing the third game of the season. You know, Ohio State, all those players play in the Sugar Bowl because – the TV, basically, I mean, you could put the whole thing that everybody wanted to make sure that they actually played that game and suspended them for the five games the next year. But, um, you know, that's the game, man. And, and to be honest, selfishly, I want to see him play in it, <laughs> which is sad. But that's my uh, take. Yeah, I mean, here's the here's the bad thing. In my opinion, what, you, what you've got here is – I mean, I think that he could be suspended for, for, I don't know, I mean, it could be anywhere from no games to the entire season to where he's just ruled ineligible. But the fact is, once again, you've got a guy who more likely is going to get in trouble for for selling an autograph, which I don't think is nearly as egregious as all the other stuff he's done. You know, him getting kicked out of camps because of drinking and being hungover and, and just being all over the place with, with – um, doing that kind of stuff. I, I don't know. I just don't see a problem with him selling autographs. It's not like a booster is giving him money that he does it, you know, that he, uh, to, to play at Texas a and his signature's worth that. If he can sell it, well, I don't see why he shouldn't be able to sell it. But, but that's what, that's what's going to cause him games, cost him games as opposed to, you know, the other just unruly stuff that he does. And I think that, you know, it's once again, we're, we're showing that we, um, we emphasize the wrong things in my opinion. My take on it, and I don't disagree with either one of you, is it's it's kind of uh, along the lines that I think everyone that you asked that's a football fan believe he believes he did it. Uh, it's just a matter now, can the NCAA prove it? You know, they have some unnamed sources that, that saw some of this going on, but they never saw the money exchange hands. Darren Ravel even said that today. And yesterday, when I listened to him as well, and he's the guy who broke this story, and, and he said directly that, you know, his sources did not actually see a transaction where money changed hands. Well, if nobody's talking, the NCAA can only prove um, what they can get the facts for. They can't just use hearsay uh, and make these allegations and put sanctions on teams and players. And it, I think it's going to kind of boil down to the Cam Newton uh, Auburn thing. You know, I think if you ask every football fan in the SEC that's not an Auburn fan, they're they're pretty dead set that Cam Newton got paid quite heavily uh, to play for Auburn. Now, was the NCAA able to prove it? No. But you also have to look at the, the body of work that the NCAA's had over the last couple of years. Look at the fiasco and the mess they've made down in Miami. You know, that was handed to them on a silver platter from Yahoo. Who, who was that? at Yahoo that did all that for Miami. Do you remember the reporter's name, Blair? Uh, not off the top of my head. But, I mean, he basically just gave it to them in a bow, and, and they couldn't even get that correct down there in Miami. So what's to think that they're going to be able to, to do what it takes mm -hmm. to get the proof they need to say that Johnny Manziel's going to be guilty? I, I, think, uh, I, I think you're right, Shane, not to interrupt, but, I mean, what it's going to come down to is he's an NCAA. You know, they don't have subpoena power, but if you're an NCAA athlete, you must comply with NCAA if you're a, a, if you're actually currently playing. So they can go after bank records and those types of things. They've done that with Cam Newton. They did that with Renardo Sidney. Um, the thing about it is, is that if Johnny Manziel took cash payment. Surely he's not dumb enough to put it in a bank account. They're going to pull up bank accounts. They're going to do that within about three weeks. And, you know, and Texas A&M is going to basically do what? They're, it's going to come down to they need resolution before they put him in a game because then they become liable. And that was the thing that Darren Rebell said. We may never find the, the, the person – uh, or have a smoking gun, so to speak, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's not going to miss a game 
because the Texas A&M is going to need this cleared before they put him on the field because then they become liable um, after that fact, just kind of like Auburn did where they just went straight ahead and, you know, they rode with they rode with Cam. So, Well, I'm willing to bet that that 10000 was probably paid in cash and was spent while they were in Miami that weekend. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. On whores and booze, probably. <laughs> Scooby-Doo outfits, at least, at the bare minimum. Yeah, something like that. Um, you know, I would let me just ask you guys: Do you think how many how many games do you think he's going to miss? If I had to, if I had to, today with what we know today with what we know, that could change tomorrow. Today with what we know, I'm going to go less than three. I'll go zero. I'm going to go zero. Yeah, I mean because. I mean, do you do you honestly think that CBS is not going to go to the SEC and the NCAA and say, hey, we're giving you guys a crap load of money, and this has been hyped up as the game of whatever? Y'all need to – and there's five weeks or six weeks until that game even is played. So there's plenty of time to actually figure this out, um, but there's nothing going to happen. Yeah. I mean, as as – you know, corrupt as that whole market is, like you talk about, Blair, the one thing that the people that actually paid the money to Manziel is not going to do is talk. Right. Because they need to be able to, to grease the next palm of the quarterback or running back that's coming through because they need those signatures too. Well, you know what it's – what's actually – Bridge. Yeah. And what's interesting is that article, you know, that came out last week and, you know – um, is the ESPN, the mag, or Sports Illustrated, whichever one it was that, you know, or that Wright Thompson wrote. And it was, you know, one of the things that stuck out to me was every time he saw his parents, they had items for him to sign. And, and his parents, it was interesting because his parents were saying they're doing it for friends and family and stuff. And they just felt like they, they just felt bad. Like they didn't want to tell them, no, my son's not going to sign this. Right. But it just seemed it just seemed kind of interesting, and then you go on eBay and just look at, you know, a helmet you know is is running for two grand. I mean, there was nothing on there less than four hundred dollars that had Johnny Manziel's signature on it. So if you're talking about thousands and hundreds of items, I mean, it's just it's amazing. And Texas A and M can get him and the other uh, the other guy that won the the uh, Heisman. Uh, I forget his name, and they signed what the they signed that football or helmet, and it goes for like twenty two thousand dollars in an organized Texas A and M fundraiser. No, eight six helmets for eighty one thousand dollars. Yeah, isn't that? I mean, but let me ask you this. I mean, just in the small amount that I've heard about uh, Manziel's dad, he seems like just a dick. I mean, just in all the stuff that he's, <laughs> you know, yeah, he comes across as, you know, they're, they're they want to trademark Johnny football and all that, and I get you know protecting a, an image and everything like that. And that's fine. I mean, if that alone, but it yeah, just seems like he's this is the image you want to portray. Exactly. It's just like here's my point. Let him play this year. Let him have an awesome year. Let him go pro, and then we'll be done with it. Because yeah. I mean, you know, he's, well, he's could... it's great for college football, and he's great for he's so much fun to watch. But it's weird because like I. I it makes me, you know, who it makes me look back on, and, and you know, all the Cam Newton stuff, and yeah, he had trouble before his Heisman year, and he, you know, maybe he did take money from from Auburn, but the but the fact is that Cam Newton, I don't remember much bad stuff out of him during the season. You know, I thought he was a pretty good guy most of the time, but uh, you know, I just, I mean, it's just unbelievable how, I mean, you're exactly right, Shane. Every week, I mean, it's going to be like next week, you know, Johnny Manziel. You know, was there when Aaron Hernandez shot that guy or something? Yeah, and I would well, be, I mean, be like, mm, okay. I mean, Drew. I mean, and to top that off, I mean, that Wright Thompson story to me was a very big eye opener because his parents. I mean, his dad is Johnny Manziel at fifty. It's basically what he is. He is basically the son of an old baron whose father was more worried about making money and didn't basically spend time with him as a son. So he has overcompensated that and allowed Johnny to be able to do anything. So he's a little bit of a spoiled brat that has a lot of money. Um, and his dad's kind of a hothead. Um, but it's interesting, the one thing that came out of it was just the deteriorating relationship between Texas A&M, Kevin Sumlin, and the Manziel family. 
Um, I mean, when he's quoted in there saying that, you know, the coach gets a million dollar raise for what my son did. Um, and, you know, I'm sick and tired of Texas a and I mean, it's, it's a little bit of an enabler type of deal that's going on, but um, it's also a 20 year old trying to figure out that every freaking thing he does, um, he likes it and he doesn't like it. Um, yeah. And he can't really make up his mind. He loves the fame, but he hates the you know the yeah. spotlight that's on him. And, and you know, did anybody see? And this is funny. Like I was watching Sports Center a little while ago, and they were showing Kevin Sumlin. Uh, he, he was his press conference. Yeah. And I hate I hate coach speak. I mean, I get why you have to do it, but they're like, you know, you know, has the NCAA notified you of any you know official investigation? He's like. Mm-mm. He's like, well, well, they would notify you, right? And he's like, well, not necessarily. And he's like, but you would know about it, right? He's like, well, not necessarily. I'm like, well, of course you'd know about it. You're the head coach. I just wish somebody, you know, wish you just. I wish they could just answer the question. Like, well, you know, is there an investigation? Yeah, he probably did it or something like that. You know, you're not going to say that, but it's just, it's so frustrating just listening to the coach speak on any time you've got one of your players that is, uh, you know, in, involved in anything. So, kind of ridiculous. Well, everyone knows that the NCAA is doing an investigation, so all he had to do is say, I cannot comment on any ongoing investigations. Right. Why can't he say yes? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are, actually. Well, yeah. you know, obviously, yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to see what, what comes of it. I mean, what do you all think about the, the, the whole thing that's obviously been going on here, which is the topic that we're actually talking about, this elephant in the room, which is should players – be able to be compensated. And, but, but before know, I mean, we answer that, I want to the ex, the other part of the news that I want to bring into this kind of relays to that, and that's uh, the verdict that came down. Um, I guess last week, before the last po- after the last podcast about the EA Sports deal, and the co- and the in the copywriting of the players, or the the likely the likeness, likeness of the likeness. players, you know. That's that's where it really stems and starts from. I mean, EA Sports has has benefited greatly off of the the like likeness of players for years, and you know that, I think that's a big blow to EA Sports, and I think that's going to completely change that model, and and I think the players are going to win that because I know they're going to fight it to the next level. But was that the state supreme court that came down with that ruling? Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking at it right now. I I know, you know, I've I've heard a lot about it, but I didn't know that there was a ruling. Yeah, there was a ruling last week where, um, you know, they ba- they basically told EA Sports that no, you're wrong. This can this can go to trial. Um, you know, you don't have a leg to stand on because they were trying to use the Constitution to or, or something to of to use the use the Constitution as a way. Like of the first trial. the First Amendment. Yeah, yeah. they they're free to. You know, it's, here's the thing that once again is ridiculous. You know, the 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 lawsuit was brought forth. It says by Sam Keller, who was a uh, a former Arizona State and Nebraska quarterback. Nobody played the game to play with Sam Keller. He doesn't have a dog in this hunt. I mean, yeah, that's Ed what O'Bannon, I hate is like, yeah, Ed O'Bannon's the one that really took it off, and I'm like, just, Sam just, Keller was the one that created it. Yeah, I see no difference. I'm not saying that I agree that EA Sports should be able to do this, but I see no difference in Sam Keller filing this lawsuit as the person filing the lawsuit at McDonald's because the coffee was too hot. This guy doesn't deserve any money. He's a nobody player, so why should he get anything? If you want to get, you know, if you said it was Eric Crouch or, you know, Tommy Frazier that was suing, yeah, that makes sense. I used to use them all the time, but I would I would bench um, Sam Keller and put, like, a fast wide receiver in as my quarterback so I could, you know, run the ball. I mean, well, nobody I mean, wants to play with that right. guy. Right. If you, if you can ever – if you could ever actually, um, if you could ever value it, the market would actually dictate that Johnny Man, you know, say Johnny Manziel for, you know, would probably be a guy that can make a lot of money, but you know, his cornerback, you know, he's probably not going to have too much, uh, you know, money made because nobody really knows who he is. Type of deal. It's going to be one of those things where some are going to be. Obviously, way, way more high profile. Um, it, it's just an interesting topic. I don't know what the right answer is. I mean, the Olympics. I mean, for crying out loud, 20 years ago, you know, the whole thing behind that was that if you allowed, you know, Michael Phelps to sell Subway sandwiches and get paid for it, that it would ruin the Olympics. When actually, it's elevated it. Right? It's elevated the the sport and the event 
um, and they still have been able to actually make money. It's just like, you know, it's 1960, you know, the CEO secretary was smoking in his office, and today we realize it kills you. Um, so, because, you know, in 1960, when there was, you know, 25 teens that were good and nobody was making any money, you know, today we're making billions of dollars, and so it's a, it's a different time, it's a different era, and they're eventually going to have to get to some type of compensation. What well, that is? Yeah, I just, I just don't. I mean, I've, I've had this same argument before, but I hate, I hate keeping bringing it up. But I just, nobody can give me a solution of, you know, Alabama makes a lot more money than than Troy. So should you make more money if you play for Alabama? Than if you do Troy, and what about the schools that don't? You know, what about the schools that don't make money in their football program and can't afford to pay people? So then it becomes professionalism because, of course, you're going to go to Alabama because you can make more money by going to Alabama. So it's 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 they're the Yankees of the of the system now. So unless you can, you, and then if you pay football, do you pay basketball? And if you pay basketball, do you pay baseball? And if you pay baseball, do you pay women's you know, field hockey, and if you pay women's field hockey, then there's no university that's women's field hockey makes money, so it just gets so hard, unless somebody can give me an answer on how to do that, I'd much rather, you know, if you can sell, I just let the, let the students sell stuff, you know, let Johnny Manziel sell his autographs, I yeah, guess, I, I don't know. I think you bring up the point, and then the problem with all of this is, is the one word, fairness, and there's not a fair way to do this that's going to make everyone happy. Uh, and and that's I think that's the whole issue with this whole thing. I think most people agree that they need some sort of compensation. The problem is there's no fair way to bring this about so that everyone can can get the equal piece of the pie. Like you said, you can't just limit it to football. Um, in in the way the NCAA is set up, and is it Title IX that that yeah. provides scholarships? I mean, all of that's just a, a bee's nest waiting to be unleashed. Yeah. That, that you can't get into, and that's that's the issue they've run into is that it's not fair. And yeah. the, the problem with that is that neither is business and life. Right. Well, it's going to happen, yeah. I mean, what's going to happen is what we're talking about, where they're going to take the six conferences, they're going to split off, they're going to have 64 teams, and they're going to be the ones that are, you know, the Middle Tennessee and the Western Kentuckys are going to play in the, in the league that they're currently in right now under a different system than Alabama in Tennessee a play under um, the NCAA and then the six <laughs> conferences are going to be in something else You're yeah right. and, and and they're going to do it across the board they're going to have to pay all 300 athletes that are on their campus and do some type of um, you know stiping type of deal that is across the board that's you know equal from that standpoint but with the football money that's coming in off of the TV revenue off of those six program six conferences they could make it happen right uh, but but that's what I think. I think you're right. I think that's where you're going to see a, a division happen. Is all of a sudden this is going to bring that breakaway of the six conferences sooner rather than later. Right. I mean, all you got to do is listen to Pac-12, SEC, Big Ten. Th just listen to those three commissioners at their media days. I mean, they beat the same drum, um, which was <laughs> all this NCAA stuff fixing to change. And things need to change, and that's what's eventually going to happen. Drew, were you getting something, or were you getting a Vanderbilt cheat sheet? <laughs> no, I had to. No, that wasn't it. I had to do some personal business real quick. No problem. On the clock. I apologize. No, you thought I, I was going to go on into our preview, but if you had something else that you were bringing into the conversation, I was going to let you have your turn. No, I don't got anything. I mean, I, you know, I think we've said it all. I think it's. It's a great, you know, that, that's one thing, you know, I can't stand talking about steroids and, and that kind of crap in sports, but I, I don't mind talking about paying the athletes. I think it's a wonderful debate topic, and, and one, I think it's a great debate topic because I think that most intelligent people can argue both sides. If You know, just like in a class, like if you were going to debate, you could right now assign me athletes should be paid, and I think I could win a debate with Blair, and you could assign me athletes shouldn't be paid. You know, I mean, I think that both of us would feel confident defending our point, so I really, I think it's a great, a great um, argument. I think you're right, though. Probably in 10 years, we're going to be like, why the hell did we not, how the hell did we go this long without paying college football players, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, I don't even know if 10 years is, that might be too far. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to happen sooner than we think, I believe. It's just, it's just right around the corner. Uh, Hey, let's talk some bandy football, Shane. 
Anchor down. Let's Who's go. Who's excited, man? Anchors, anchors away. All right. Let's get Who's right jumping down. off the cliff? <laughs> hey, you know what they say that James Franklin was the best uh, football hire in Vanderbilt history? You know, I think it was Derek Dooley. <laughs> is the best hire in Vanderbilt football history. That guy let let Vanderbilt get on the map from his ineptitude. So, Vandy simultaneously hired the two greatest coaches. There you go. What 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 are you excited about Vanderbilt football, Drew? Um, no, I mean, in, in all honesty, I think this is you have to be pumped. I think that Vanderbilt's, golly, it's hard to say overrated. I don't think they're a top twenty-five team. Um, I don't think they're a top, you know, 30 team, you know, just even if they're just kind of on that others receiving boats, just because I think they're going to lose a lot with Jordan Rogers being out. Uh, Austin Carter Samuels is, is penciled in, and I just don't know, you know, with that unproven quarterback, what, what he's going to be able to do. They've got they return a lot on their offensive line, and they return, you know, uh, one of their better receivers of all time, and you know, actually two receivers, two good yeah. receivers. And, and you know that Wesley Tate and Brian Kimbrough can both run the ball. So they return a good offense. And then I think they've got like six out of 11 on defense back. And I don't know that they had just a star-studded cast on defense. They've had some good, uh, they've had some good defensive backs the last few years. But I think it's more of a system where they, they've really learned to play hard and, and they do well on defense because they, you know, they come to play and they, they're coached well. So I think there's a lot to be excited about. But once again, I think that it's, you know, I think they, they could definitely be staring a six or seven win season in the teeth, you know, just because they're in a very, very tough conference and, and, and losing that quarterback uh, is a very difficult thing to do. That's so fascinating what you just said. Did you hear what you just said? What's that? You said they're going to be staring a six or seven win season in the face, which is, I mean, it's Vanderbilt we're talking about. I mean, I look at this schedule and I go, man, I've got them at least winning seven ball games. I, that I think they're favoring. They're, you know, I think there's five games. I think there's four games where they're they're going to be underdogs in. I think they're, there's a couple of tosses. They don't ever play anybody out of conference, so of course you like their schedule. They got beat by Northwestern last year out of conference. Yeah, exactly. That was their tough week. Tough Northwestern game. I mean, hey, that, that was week. Don't say nothing about that. They whipped us in the Gator Bowl. That's fine. Uh, I mean, just, everybody hangs their hat on that. By all means, they had a, a fine season. But once again, you know, you see Vanderbilt scheduled, you know, Michigan and, and Notre Dame a couple of years, and they got off that bandwagon pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah, no. Well, I know. I mean, if you got the, I mean, it's no Tennessee schedule. Um, that's for sure. You know, five out of what top ten in the first six. But yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I think Drew, what you I think you hit on the, I think you hit it on the head with uh, Carter Samuel. I mean. I think he's the, the key to the whole thing. I think what one of the things I just look at is they're going to have running backs. They're going to have two stud uh, wide receivers uh, with Chris Boyd Roscoe, sure and uh, Roscoe Pico Train. Is that right? Um, and I mean, I mean, I don't know what y'all think, but I think for a guy to get comfortable at quarterback an offensive line that's experienced like they've got, especially on the ends at tackle and at center uh, with, uh, I think, a couple of productive um, options at running back and then two really, really productive receivers um, could give them enough, um, you know, in that early part of the season to get some confidence. Uh, I think the Ole Miss game is just a huge game. Uh, I think it's huge for both of them. Um, I think more so for Ole Miss just because they've got such a tough schedule on the front end. Um, I think Vandy can bounce back a little bit easier than, than Ole Miss because they just don't play as tough of a schedule in that first five or six games. But um, Yeah, but if they, you say that, they, if they lose, they go two and two. Yeah. Because yeah. they're not going to beat South Carolina. Right. At least I don't think so. I think, I think it's a consensus. Yeah, but I mean, compare it. What I was just comparing it to was the whole business schedule. Which, if you see that, I mean, they've got yeah, they got they're... Murder's Road in the first seven ball games. I think um, six away, and yeah, you've got Vanderbilt, they've got Texas. They've got they got everybody in the West. I mean, they they really have a light back into the schedule. So, you yeah, know, they you stayed as light. Huh? Yeah, but uh, I mean, I don't know, guys. I mean. If I was looking at this and said, "Hey, Vanderbilt is, uh, you know, they're they're a team." That, I mean, they pulled, they did this exact same game last year, 
uh, against South Carolina, opened up the season. They've kind of been here and done this. Um, didn't play particularly well. It's kind of a sloppy game, and um, I'm just interested to see. I think it'll be a little bit more familiar to them. That's why I, I think they'll have a little bit more of an edge um, with it being at home. Um, but if they could start out the gate with that, I think that's a whole key to their season right there because they could start out four and one. Well, yeah, I mean they could, you know, they, and the five and one they got Missouri as their uh, sixth game. You are correct. So I think, so I think they've, they've got, got a, a they've got, got a good, good shot at, at starting off five and one or, or four and two. Here's the thing is they better start off four and two, you know, because then they've got the meat of their schedule coming up after that, and that's just going to be a, a tough part. I mean, I, like I said, I don't know what else to say. You know, I might even take back what I said. I mean, I I, I look at it and, and they're you know they're a seven win team. You know, bump one win that they maybe they squeak out eight win team, and I guess yeah, I guess that's the twenty fifth best team in the nation, and that's you know if you're eight four in the SEC, so maybe they're about where they're supposed to be. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just it's still Vanderbilt. It's hard for me to just believe that they're gonna come out gangbusters. And, well, the thing that I look at, yeah, the thing that I look at is the Shoop has pretty much proven that you know in his two years as a defense coordinator that he is. He's going to get that defense right. They got three stud defensive ends. They're a little bit weak interior, but uh, they settled down a linebacker and core, and they've got a stud cornerback um, that's coming back. And so they got three levels there. Um, I think they're going to be pretty solid. And if they can finish in the top six, you know, they were fourth in defense last year, and I think eighth in offense. If they're finishing that top six in defense again, they're going to win a ball game. Um, and so. Um, I, I just think it's uh, I think it's pivotal in that first game to get started off, especially when it's an SEC game. Yeah, and the one other thing you mentioned about Vanderbilt that that it's such a it's a rarity is they had zero coaching changes. You know, if, if you're wanting something, if you want to talk about a program that's got something to build upon, it's you've got every coach coming back. So, so you've got all of that success you had last year. You've got a lot of returning players that are comfortable with the coaching system and the the way the program's <clears> going to go. They understand it. It's going to be. It's definitely going to be more comfortable for them this year than last year. The one thing, though, that that I take issue with, and, and given Vanderbilt just such a such a, a cakewalk the, the the rest of the way, is the fact that you know everyone in the SEC is getting better. You know, Vanderbilt has ha already had its run of luck to to run across Tennessee, very down, uh, Kentucky down. Both of those programs, uh, you're, you're going to have to admit, are on an upswing. Kentucky's probably still another year away from being where they were a couple years ago to, to contend for a bowl game, but they're they're definitely on an upswing. Look at their recruiting and what they're bringing to the table this year. A lot of improvements, still some some pieces there. They were riddled with injuries last year. You've got a Tennessee program that, by all indications, out out east is is you know ready to go. So they've already had their chance to to really get where they did, and they did it. They took advantage of it last year and ended up 9-4. and four. I don't see that they could get back to that this year. Yeah, I mean, uh, nine, nine wins is pretty tough. I mean, you're but saying, I, mean, I, I say that I'm not saying that they're going to beat Kentucky or they're going to lose to Kentucky and Tennessee this year. Um, but, you know, the, with the rest of the schedule they have, I just don't see them getting to that, that level. Yeah, I think the, the last thing I'll say about them is, is James Franklin – we know what he's done as a promoter of the school and as a recruiter. He's put them in, in different level. But I also think as a coach, I mean, Vanderbilt, when I watched them last year, they're a team that it seems like gets the most out of their talent. Uh, I think that they had some talent, maybe a little more than they uh, they have in the past. But, yeah, I mean, I also think that, that James Franklin just does a really good job of, of getting, you know, squeezing the most juice out of those players. And, they, I mean, that's what you have to do to win nine games. Uh, and and I don't know. I mean, I think that they could win as many as nine games. I think they could win five games. I think there's a big a big uh, a big gap there. But the the good thing for Vanderbilt this year is that I think that the gap is going to be you know from six to eight wins somewhere in that section as opposed to in the years past where it's been from two to five wins. So I was going to be generous and say four to six. So they had a shot to go to the bowl uh, because you know they they. One thing that hasn't really changed with Vanderbilt is the four four guaranteed wins. Yeah. 
with, with the programs that are out of out of the SEC. And I'm ready. I'm yeah. I'm, I'm ready to go through the schedule if y'all are. Yeah. Ole Miss. Uh, I've got I've got a Vandy win against Ole Miss. I do too. I think they're going to lose. So, Austin P. I think they win that yep. win that game. South Carolina. I think that's a loss. Massachusetts. Win. And yeah, considering they beat them by 42 last year, I'm going to say win. UAB. Uh, I got a W. I got a win there as well. Uh, same here, Missouri. I think they beat Missouri as well. I do too. Yeah, no, no changes there. So so far, we all agree on everything except I disagree with you all and Ole Miss. Then we get to Georgia, October 19th. I got them losing that game. Blair, I got a loss. I've got them at a loss. Texas A&M at College Station. Loss. I got a loss right now. I do too. I I think even if I, I put it up there, they could go eight and four if Manziel's out. I, I, that's a swing game for them if, if for some reason Manziel might be out. I, they could they could go in and squeak one out there, but then they turn around and go at Florida. Loss. 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 Kentucky. I think they w. win that game. Yep, me too. Tennessee. W. Uh, that's a big loss. That's a W. <laughs> I've got that as a W. They're not beating Tennessee in Knoxville. W. I'm just telling you right now. Don't go bet your paychecks, guys. Wake Forest to W. Yeah, I've got a win there. All right. So I think I think I know I I had to drop off there for a second because I lost my volume. But uh, I know you're talking about the Kentucky and Tennessee. I think I just think I feel I think this year I think next year is the deal where we're going to find out where Vanderbilt is um, from a standpoint of where they are from a depth recruiting. Because Tennessee and Kentucky, I think you're going to see a major jump next year, um, because they're so huge on the recruiting trail right now. But those players aren't on the season. Tennessee has got a murder row in that first six games. You just hope they survive it and can try to figure out a way to get six and six. Um, the interesting thing, Will, I don't know what Tennessee schedule is, Drew, but I'm assuming it ends with Vandy and Kentucky, like always, right? Correct. So if they're sitting there at four and six going into the Vanderbilt game, I give Tennessee that, – that turns into a different game um, because then that gives them an opportunity to get to that bowl game. Um, that means that they have righted the ship and got some things going after, you know, playing those five tough games in that first six weeks. But I just think it's hard for Tennessee to – get more than a six wins if you know and so I think Vanderbilt has the ability just from a schedule standpoint to be just a notch above them. Oh I think you know I didn't want to say this but no I don't think Tennessee is even close to the team they were last year. Uh, they lost a lot of I mean just an incredible amount of talent on offense uh, in Bray and Hunter and and Patterson and, and Zach Rogers and yeah. Michael Rivera. I mean they're, they're losing their top four options yeah, and you think at receiver, and, right. and they're losing a very talented quarterback. But the, the other, the flip side of that, and I know I said this so many times last year, and y'all are just going to laugh at me again. But I don't. Tennessee was better than a five and seven team last year. Yes. You look at you look at their games. Actually, it's funny because before this today, I was looking at YouTube. I was uh, somebody posted some highlights from the Georgia game last year. I mean, Tennessee was right in that game, and Tyler Bray fumbled. You know, so they were one score away from winning at Georgia. Uh, they were driving to win the game against South Carolina and Bray fumbled, you know, and that's a three-point loss. Uh, the Florida game was a close game before they kind of got, kind of got uh, just outplayed. Just, just looking at that, I mean, God bless Tennessee's defense was so bad. So bad. I, I mean, if, that's if the whole thing. Tennessee had. Here's the funny thing, Blair. If, if Tennessee had, let's just say they had their their normal John Chavis style defenses, Tennessee would have been a nine or ten win team. Yep. Maybe a ten ten win team last year. They could have, you know, if, if a few things fall the right way, I mean, they're they're competing for an SEC championship. But and Derek Dooley would still be there. No, because right. Derek Dooley was dumb enough to hire Sal Sanceri and, and just have the worst defense in the history of college football. Yeah, and I think you'll see that correction, Drew. I think you're going to see, you know, you're not going to give up 35 points a game. You may give up 21. <laughs> But you're not going to score 35 points a game. No, not you may score. You might score 20. So I Unless think they're they, going to come back and kind of even out a little bit, which gives you an opportunity to win. Yeah. The problem is you got freaking 
your schedule, man. It's just insane. That's Tennessee, baby. That's what we do. I can't wait to talk about it here in a few weeks. All right, anything so, else we want to say with Mandy? We'll go hit her open mic. All right, Blair, you want to lead us off? Anything you want to say before we close up shop for the night? Man, I'm just excited, guys. Um, I mean, Titans are starting on Thursday. Go have a little, get a little bit of teaser uh, with a little preseason game on Thursday. So I'm excited about it. And, uh, um, you know, I'm just ready for college football. And, I mean, you know, it's, I love today's technology because, you know, I can miss the first four practices for Mississippi State and then 45 minutes on a Saturday morning I can basically catch up with everything that's happened um, in a central location. So it's it's just awesome, but uh, I'm excited about it. Looking forward to it. Drew? Uh, same stuff. I'm pumped about football starting. I've got – you know, the, the balls and the Titans and my fantasy college football team and my fantasy um, NFL team and then my flag football team. I drafted draft of the day. I think I've got my best team ever. Uh, I'm pretty pumped. If you want to, you know, if you want to follow some good uh, U13 flag football, then come on out to Brentwood, Tennessee and follow the U13 Seahawks. There you go. I think we're ready to go. You can follow me at Drew Young 20. And that's up on the screen as well for everyone. Blair, can anyone follow you? Yes, at Blair Smiley, S M Y L Y. Awesome. What happens if you follow Blair? Do you? I mean, he doesn't know. He's he hadn't tweeted in about a year, so. I need to I need to flip y'all my uh, Chris Jones pictures that uh, y'all will be impressed with. So I'll flip those to you. I'll the retweet them. The only time you can get some get him to tweet is if you yeah go directly at him. Yeah. We we got a little bit of banter back from him a couple months ago. So yeah, what do you got for us, Shane? You know, I don't have much. Uh, I I know that it's been a great summer here in Tennessee. It's not been hot. I wish I'd got to do a little more fun activities outside and enjoyed it. Uh, but uh, I did. I have been out quite a bit, and it's just been very pleasurable. I think it's almost over. Our reprieve is over, from what I understand from the weather. We're getting normal um, August weather coming in finally but it's just been great to have it just right around 90 with some low humidity uh, you can get out in the evening it's very comfortable I've, I've just been super happy about that and any, if anyone cares to follow me it's at P Shane Bailey guys thank you all so much for listening uh, we've got uh, just a few more podcasts left on our SEC football preview I think there's four teams left my math is correct and uh, we'll we got, have we got a lot of the good ones left too. So yeah, yeah. everybody but Tennessee. Uh, we've got three more weeks. We've got uh, Florida, Georgia, and Tennessee on the east. We've got LSU, A and M, and Alabama on the west. That's the six best teams in the SEC, don't we? Yeah, at least five. We'll say five of them. Five or six, Drew. You, you, hey. can, you can figure out which ones, which one I'm talking about. That's fine. You still put Tennessee in that group for, for saving them for last because you know where the money maker is. Wow. You, you, tend <laughs> to you just, you just like watching me get mad. <laughs> it's so easy, though. Yeah. And, guys, with that, we're going to call this podcast done.